Welcome to Beyond Social, the podcast that explores how professionals use social media platforms to improve the way they work and live. As always, I'm your host, Jason Seiden. You can call me Jace. You can find me all over the web. The easiest place to look me up is at ajaxsocialmedia.com. Today we're going to be talking about authenticity. It's a word that gets bandied about quite often, but is a little more difficult, a little more nuanced to put into practice than most people realize. We're fortunate to have with us as our guest today, William Tincup. William is known if you're in the HR space and especially the HR social media space, you'll know his name. He ran the most successful, most biggest, most popular uh, marketing agency in the HR space. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, William, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me, Jason. And I want to talk to you right off the bat about something you did last week. Mm-hmm. We're gonna, a lot of people talk about authenticity. You're out on the front lines living it. Uh-huh. Last week, you posted a number of photos onto Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we had a brief conversation about this earlier. I think what you did is uh, something that a lot of people can relate to. You're in the process of losing a lot of weight, and mm-hmm. you posted some photos. You were, going through, you were going through photos, getting in touch with the skinny self that you have been, mm-hmm. and you posted some of those photos online. Uh, a couple of them take you back. You posted a prom photo, and mm-hmm. that's the one that I want to call out. You look, sure. you look great in your turquoise tie. I think I had one of those. Appreciate that. Spiky hair. Mm-hmm. And the comment, before anybody else, these were posted on Facebook, and you posted a comment on your own photo, and I don't remember the exact words, but it was to the effect of, you know, you can tell by my eyes the ecstasy hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, if you start with, the, the meta layer is real simple. Uh, a couple months ago, in September, I weighed uh, 255, and at... Uh, Five nine, I should weigh somewhere between 150 and 170. So basically, I'm 100 pounds overweight. Uh, my wife and I are both losing weight together, and we have two young kids, and I want to live a long life. So the the backdrop is pretty simple. I finally, at 43 years old, uh, decided that I will actually want to live uh, a long life. So the pound and a half, two pounds, three pounds, four pounds a year through my 18 year marriage. It just adds up. Uh, It's not like you suddenly wake up one day and you let yourself go. It just, in some cases, it's just a gradual process. I now want to reclaim the skinny guy that uh, that I remember, but no one else does. Uh, The skinny guy that's inside of me. I'm a small frame guy, uh, but no one knows it because they assume both because of my gregarious nature uh, and because I have a shit ton of weight on me that I'm a big guy. And in truth, I'm not really a big guy. So that's all the backdrop to I needed to, I needed to actually the world ish, the people that I interact with, to think of me in future terms as a skinny person. Because mon- mo- the challenge of losing weight is a life challenge and life change and you know bad habits, getting away from fast food, typical fucking shit that everybody goes through. But oh, by the way, it's also other people's perception of you. And so it's the management of other people's perception of you that I had to actually put out there in the marketplace, okay, stop thinking of me a fat guy. Think, you know, think of me uh, that I, there was, eventually, there was, there used to be a skinny guy inside of me. So I need to reclaim that. So I posted about mm, 10 photos, mostly uh, life moments where I was skinny. Day I got engaged, day I got married, day I did this, whatever. But all these skinny photos. Now these are things that people can relate to. Yeah. And I think you know most of the people listening <clears throat> can relate to that. Can relate to the idea of posting photos, uh, posting photos from their younger days. Yeah. Uh, getting in touch with the skinny person inside of them. Yeah, yeah. But the comment that you made, and yeah. and and I think people can probably get a sense for the the answers you're giving so far. I mean, sure. you, you don't you don't shy away from dropping an f bomb no. you know, in the conversation. But you went and you posted a, uh, you posted a comment. Yeah, about ecstasy. Here's the irony about ecstasy. Uh, in '85 and '86, uh, ecstasy was legal. The FDA had not uh, banned uh, ecstasy. Uh, so while I was in my heyday uh, in high school, I actually did a lot of X, uh, both dealing it and taking it. But it was all legal. 
uh, because uh, the government had not figured out yet what was there. It's like Kava Kava. If you've ever gone into a GNC, Kava Kava is a route uh, in the you know, Pacific Islands that's uh, a hallucinogen. Well, evidently the FDA hasn't figured out that the that's that's what it is, yeah, right. and that's there, how people use it. There, by the way, there's a great book called "Getting Stoned with Savages." Yeah, travel book, Kava Kava, all yeah. about it. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's kind of like a little light peyote. But the the thing about ecstasy is real simple. Uh, it's a part of who I was. Uh, my best friend in high school bought a briefcase of ecstasy in Mexico, um, and we sold it over a nine month period, and he made about eight hundred thousand dollars doing X. Now. You are, you're not just in business. Oh, he was in business. I was no, just no, no. a friend. I'm, not, I'm talking about fast forward oh, yeah, to yeah. Uh, modern day. Sure. You're not just in business. You've run a marketing agency. Sure. Right? Of all the companies, of all the people who should know better yeah. than to talk about that kind of See? stuff. See? Right? It should be you. It's all, you know, the thing is, I think that, that that's the line. That ultimately, I use a lot of that stuff as a filter of you know, people that should never be around me. So if, if, if you're wired that you can't handle uh, adult language, we should never meet. We should never intersect in life. If, uh, if you uh, are wired in such a way, once again, I'm making a lot of value judgments about people, but that's what happens uh, in life, uh, and especially in social. If someone sees the ecstasy comment and ultimately thinks, oh my gosh, this guy, he does drugs, or he did drugs 20 years ago, and somehow that affects our relationship, well, I've just put you in the moron bucket, and it would be great if you just unfriended me, because eventually that's going to be a train wreck, because someone's going to say, you, 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 talk, hide it, right? you talk openly about drugs, it's like, yeah, and? So let's, so there's going to be a lot of folks uh, listening and, sure. and like I, I lead a pretty clean life myself sure. but we uh, we all have things like that in mm -hmm. our life where we, we get to this decision point and we say should we share that should we not share that mm -hmm. and people have been dealing with this for centuries eons right since the dawn of time like yeah. should I should I tell this guy that I clubbed yeah. his brother over at the next clan or should Sorry I keep that to myself right yeah, yeah. but now all of a sudden with social media that stuff is transparent we're confronted with it and people are now dealing with it a little bit differently. I think because it's out in the open. Yeah. So now we have people looking and saying, well, you know, if I, uh, if I share this, if I don't share this information about myself, I'm being inauthentic to my true self. Hmm. And that's running smack up against the, well, my authentic self can't stay employed here. Yeah, I think, well, I've got a couple things going on that, that uh, I think that ultimately, I want the discourse about me to be uh, not a stylistic one, but a substance one. So I've dealt with all my life, 50% uh, of the people that meet me love me, and the other 50% want to see me die a very slow and painful death. So I have, that's my life. That goes all the way back to childhood. Literally, it, it falls, you either love me or hate me. If you hate me, well, great. I just I wrote you off anyhow, because you're an idiot. If you love me, then I'm in forever. Which actually works because they've written you off too because you're Turns out. Yeah. yeah. So everything kind of works out there and we can agree to disagree, etc. So the, the thing is, is where, where this... Hold on. I got I to gotta jump in for a second. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole series of questions that I've got for you. Go ahead. The first one, right? I, I spent 10 years uh, coaching people. Uh-huh. And I'll tell you, the hang up to success is not intellectual. Mm -hmm. It's emotional. Mm -hmm. Right? The ego... Cheapest yeah. thing we have to give up. Like intellectually, yeah. we know that. Geez, if I could just get over my own ego, I could have anything I want in this world. I don't know why. <laughs> but apparently, it's kind of expensive. It's, we hold it dear. Yeah. So you sit here and you say, like, my whole life, people love me or hate me, and that's what it is. And you say that, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at you in the face. You're, you're at peace with that comment. <laughs> yeah. How long did it take you to become at peace with that reality about yourself? Middle school. I was at peace in middle school. So you got a you got a head start. Yeah, yeah. Um, was there a trigger event? No, I uh, I have a really low vision, uh, legally blind in both eyes, and uh, had Coke bottle glasses. I mean, literally an inch thick uh, glasses. Um, but I could I could outthink most of my teachers. So on that's a one, dangerous combination. Yeah, on, one, <laughs> on one level, on one level, like people are like, who is this? 
you know, with Coke bottles, but seemingly teaching the class now. Um, and so, like, that part, I finally figured out that everybody has something. Like, very early on in, like, fourth and fifth grade, I, I realized that life's not what people think it is. Like, oh, that person's perfect, or this guy is fat, and obviously something's wrong. No, everybody's got something. And getting fast forward to the social stuff, there is no 100% transparent. That is, a, it could be a lofty goal, it could be aspirational, but no one is 100% transparent. We all make some judgments. I'm addicted to porn. Probably no one will ever know that. Okay, check. <clears throat> now, am I not transparent? Yeah, of course you're not transparent because ultimately people can't handle all of you and all of your eccentric behaviors get to the real good stuff and all your vices. Yeah, I like, and, to, I like to say everybody's normal until their family or a neighbor. Yeah. Right, because then you start to then you start to get to know the whole them. You wash your car three times a week. Yeah. Okay, right. Right. not sure what's going on there, <laughs> but anyhow. So everyone's got something, and that's the thing that you know. As you have kids, you really you're trying to instill that in them. That yeah, that guy looks perfect. Yeah, the 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 guy that's the quarterback in high school, he looks perfect. He will max out at 22. He'll peak, and it's done. So, do you want to be that guy? Are you sure you want to be that guy? No, you don't. Well, so there, there, There's something there also that not only does everyone have something, yeah. but it, it's not always that somebody's walking around with a terrible secret today. That's you right. got to take it over the, over point. the course of a lifetime. That's right. Yeah. And so, when you, when you come to peace with like, okay, everybody's got something. I'm flawed. You know, uh, I've made a whole lot of mistakes. I've done all kinds of terrible shit. Great. You know what? So is everybody else. So I think where social, where people have to make a decision is if you're an employee, I mean, there really are a couple different wirings of people. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, not a forced entrepreneur, but a true, like you wake up and you're like, like you, you, you understand and respect the hustle. You just want to hustle type of entrepreneur. Well, then what you have in that person is they don't care as much about the hireability aspects of social media. Like, so some of the stuff that happens in social media, uh, for me, I'm probably never have a job in my life. Well, let's talk about that for a second. I want to I unpack that a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. Because in addition to the, the social media communication trends, we have some very real economic trends happening. Sure. And, you know, so we've got a lot of people who are unhappy at work, who are yeah. out of work. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we ever get a flat tax, we're going to have a whole lot of accountants yeah. looking for work I'd tomorrow, right? Tax. Uh, <clears throat> So I think one of, the, one of the things that I hear a lot of people struggle with is the very notion of job versus no job. Should I go chase the... But everyone's got something. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, I'm, I'm hearing you say, well, you know, I'll never have a job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I want to unpack that a little bit. So let, let's, sure. let's understand your story. I'll build stuff. So and, like, but take us back in time. Like, did you, did you, have you ever had a job? Yeah, yeah. I worked for Walmart for uh, almost five years, Albertsons for three years when I was in high school, uh, then went to college for th eight years, three degrees, then I worked at a startup for 18 months, then I started my own gig. All right, so... Because 12 years ago, I, I woke up and I'm like, the, the person that I love, the person that was the CEO at the time, was is not taking my advice. And if someone doesn't take my advice, I find that uh, I can't be around them. So i have now got to go do it myself. So it's part arrogant, part confident, and also it's just it, there's a glide in frustration. I'm going to, well, be less frustrated over time because I can't blame me. Mm -hmm. And if I take all the barriers out, okay, so it's a hustle. i got to go sell. i got to go do some things. Great. How did this translate into, uh, into the marketing business that you had? When we first started, we didn't... I mean, actually, Brett and I would probably tell you that... Brett that, Star, your, yeah, Brett your Star. partner. Mm -hmm. um, it, well, we, we probably went through eight different iterations of the business. And to by the way, for, for sure. folks listening who aren't familiar with Star Tin Cup, uh, you, were the, you were the agency of record for more companies, yeah. more HR companies and companies selling into HR than any other agency out yeah. there, right? So this is not yeah. this is not a single shingle. I mean, you, no, you, we built a dominant play, but it took... Um, Best employer in Dallas, how many years running? They, uh, they've got a 
best places to work three years and they'll have it four years because it's wired for that. <clears throat> okay. So the, the thing is, is like, it took us forever to get to that place. And the reason is that every time we felt like we almost got it, we then changed the direction. So as an entrepreneur would do, okay, let's get in the market and do this. Okay, market doesn't like that. Great. Let's get Pivot. in the market and do this. <laughs> Pivot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, and at one point, 06, we were sitting on, I don't know, probably 18, 20 clients in HCM. And we said, we got to make the business more simple. We got to focus. We got to look for who's highly profitable. Where's the growth? Who do we like? Like, what type of business now, six years later, what's the business that we really want to do? When we focused on HR, the people that sell to HR, the vendors that sell to HR, was that moment. That was when the clouds parted. And then a year later, we organized the business around best places to work. So we literally structurally built the business to have phenomenal compensation and phenomenal, um, you know, work environment and great benefits. So in line, when I say wired to win those awards, it was literally orchestrated to win those awards because when you, when you, you know, we know the rules. So we organized the business around there. I mean, it is a game of keep the employee, not attract the employee. Anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's a dominant play. And then when I left in June of, uh, of last year, you know, I basically have three years to kind of figure out what I want to do next. And, you know, some people would take that three years of cash flow and then go hike Kilimanjaro or get stoned and play PlayStation every well, day. Yeah, hold on, because I know what you're doing now, and I, I want to dive into that separately. Sure. But when you were at, when you were at Star Tin Cup, mm-hmm. you're running Star Tin Cup. <clears throat> you have this attitude uh, that you've had since junior high of, look, 50% of the world's going to love me, 50% yeah. is going to hate me. Yeah. Uh, you, you're not bashful. You're not hiding yourself. Mm-mm. You're walking into clients who I'm guessing, you know, they're hiring you to do their marketing. Yep. So they're hiring you to polish and protect their brand, right? It's all about imaging. No, actually. And, and here comes you. Okay, great. Right? It's, no, it, here's, what, here's what really went on at that time. And it, it really was a stroke of brilliance. And, and I chalked this up to pretty much everyone at Star 10 Cup uh, at the time. Because what, what we did is we looked at the market. And we said, you know, there's always, there's always players in the market. And at that time... There were three players in the market: HR Marketer, Fisher Vista, uh, the the Devon Group, uh, uh, which is a PR firm out of New Jersey, and the Delve Group, which is out of New York. Those were basically the competitors. And when you look at them, their services mix was ish plus or minus about the same of ours. So, to the outside world, you really wouldn't be able to to, to distinguish. Uh, those firms from our firm and we had less cred than they did because they had they were more established they'd already had more clients all that stuff so it was game theory go where they're not so we looked at where they are and they're all very conservative plays very conservative plays because PR by by its very nature is a very conservative right. business because it's all about goodwill and sure. reputation and actually a bunch of horseshit that's a side note so uh, they had positioned themselves as, uh, as very conservative. So we looked at that and we said, you know what? We're rock stars. We're the premium brand. So what we did is purposely position them down market. So their billable rate was 150, ours was 400. Uh, you know, they would come in and wear sweater vest. We would come in with ashes all over our clothes and glitter like we'd just gotten out of a strip club, high, got a little bourbon on us, and we'd tell people that all their shit's fucked up. Because ultimately... Literally in that language. Yeah. And the reason for that, all this was purposely orchestrated in some ways. Well, some of it is... We would purposely get the bourbon off the shelf and drink it. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Pour it on our heads. Well, some of it was dealing with the idiosyncratic behaviors of Brett, myself, and the firm. Whereas we were young, we wanted to have fun, we wanted to be bring innovation to people, etc. Um, and we wanted to be rock stars. And, and technically, Brett was a rock star. He was hired, uh, excuse me, he had a contract with Universal Records. And technically, he's like in six or seven different bands in Austin during the 90s. He actually is a rock star. Uh, I was just a poser. So, you know, the thing is, is we positioned all these other folks purposely as they're not innovators. They, so, I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, correct. you made the business work for you. Yeah, we brought the customers to us. We brought the customers and prospects to our idiosyncratic behavior, and here's the reason why. We built filters. 
we talked openly about porn, drug, gambling, tobacco, like all the things that you shouldn't talk about, politics, religion, we got them all out there. And we actually put them all out there on our website Mm -hmm. and in our entryway. Like when you would come back then, not now, but back then when you come, when you would come into the office, there were dancing girls on the left hand side. There was a strobe light and a bar and all kinds of stuff like, okay, oh, so you're offended? Why the hell are you here? Now, the, the real reason for all of this, quite frankly, is a business to sell shit, to make shit, do shit. Um, but it was a filter of who not to work with. So if you wanted to, us to be order takers, like if you thought you were the smartest marketer in the room, well, fuck it, you're not. So well, now we have to have that contest. We didn't want to ever have that contest because we wanted people to be offended and leave or look at all that and go, these guys are geniuses. They, uh, they get it. Was it early days before you before the model had proven itself out? Mm-hmm. Any scary days where you said, uh, we might be crossing a line here that we can't come back from? I never, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, with my podcast, with, with Drive Through, I never go back and listen. Brian, God love him. Brian goes and listens to every episode. Every episode, he'll go back and listen to. Brian Weapon, the, yeah, yeah. the the brainchild. He of is drive yeah. founder drive-thru. and and brainchild of drive through. The I can't go backwards, so I'm one of these perfect. I'm the perfect defensive back. I never have been burned for a touchdown, and uh, in 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 that type of uh, you know model and mindset, did I make mistakes? Did we make mistakes? Oh hell yeah. Did I languish over those mistakes? No. Was I reflective? And I'm asking a lot of uh, questions. But ultimately, did I learn from every one of those things? Eh, yeah, of course. But I made game time decisions and just kept going forward. Now, there's a difference between how I hear you describe these experiences and mm-hmm. how I hear a lot of other people describe them. Mm-hmm. The absence of fear plays yeah. right up at the front. Mm-hmm. The fact that you figured this out as early as you did yeah. also plays prominently. The... Um, <clears throat> as a corollary to the absence of fear, yeah. the willingness and ability to take that risk. Yeah. Right? There's a lot of people who aren't afraid, but they just, yeah. they're risk averse. It's just they get off their couch. Yeah, so you know, there, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of stars that aligned here, either naturally or because you reached up into the sky and pulled them into <laughs> position. So we'll, we'll talk about what you're doing currently in a moment, but sure. for somebody who's sitting here and they're stuck in a job, or, you know, it's actually somebody who's actually weighing the, the, the question on their mind, should I quit this job? I want to be my authentic self. I want to live that life. Sure. There's a couple triggers here that I'm hearing, and I'm wondering on your mind, like, what are the things that they should mentally, what's that checklist they should go through me- mentally to say, am I really ready for this? Yeah, you got to strip naked. And uh, I won't do this here with you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. It's bad enough they, from what I can see. <laughs> It gets worse. <laughs> I, I am definitely not Brad Pitt and Snatch. Um, so the thing is, is like uh, there's a vulnerable moment that you have to have with yourself where you strip down, you get in front of a, na- uh, a mirror, and you analyze your warts. You analyze everything that's there that makes you you. And, I, and this is figuratively and literally, but the whole idea is you deconstruct yourself. And you try to figure out what you're really the top 2% at, the top 5% at. If you can't find what your top 2 or top 5% is, then you probably don't have that. that that's kind of a reality. The other part is... I call that, I, I say there's probably two kinds of people in the world. There's mm-hmm. generalists and specialists. Mm-hmm. Specialists are the ones with that top 2%. Yeah. Generalists are probably on planet Earth to learn as much as they can about yeah. whatever they happen to be in front of. Sure. Well, the, the, the two overlays that I want to put on this analysis, one is a passion inventory and a competency inventory. So the, the it all starts with being vulnerable. It all starts... <laughs> so I'm naked and I'm taking inventory. Yeah. This is dangerous. Yeah, see, see where we're going? And then, I don't know, then we're going to play games. So anyhow, the, uh, the, the idea is that you're vulnerable insofar as you just don't lie to yourself. There's no one else in the room. You're not trying to please your wife or whomever. You're just telling the truth. You know what? I fucking hate writing. Okay. Forgive yourself. Move on. But you have to be vulnerable. You have to actually... Have, it can't be a, I'm great at everything. You've got to really kind of start to find the warts, the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, the things that hold you back, all that stuff. Then layer on top of that your passion inventory. Okay? If the world were different and you could do something, 
what is it? And I'm not even talking about work. Just like you want to paint? Okay, good. Let's figure out what you're really passionate about. Helping others, you know, doing whatever. I don't give a shit, but ultimately, what is that passion? Then the next overlay is what are you competent at? Because you can be passionate at something, but not competent, or competent at something, and not passionate. So it's a Venn diagram that ultimately what you're trying to find is the overlay of where does my passion, where's my chocolate you know, intersect with my peanut butter? Where does that come together? And if it doesn't come together for you, then you have to navigate those things together. You either have to figure out what your passions are, and or then you have to figure out how do I build competencies. Competencies can, can be built. So uh, a lot of them can. There's a few that are yeah. a little tricky. Truth. So for, uh, for those of you uh, <clears throat> just dialing in, you're listening to Beyond Social. Our guest today is William Tincup. I'm Jason Seiden. And we're talking about uh, your authentic self and, and the challenges of being your authentic self online. And uh, William, as, as we unpack your story and, mm-hmm. and we explore it, you know, the, uh, the inventories that you're talking about, uh, are, it, it's fascinating. Because as I listen to your story, I can hear each one of those. Yeah. Right, and some of the things that stand out to me are, number one, the honesty about yourself. Yeah. Right? One of the greatest compliments my wife ever gave me was we were, it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was yeah. Cool, clearly, right? Uh, but we, we said, I admitted something to her, and she just looked at me, and I'm like, I have no problem being naked in front of you. And I was speaking metaphorically, yeah, yeah. but like, I, I, I just, there's no time, yeah. right? And she just said, that's probably the nicest thing you've ever said to me, right? So the, the honesty with yourself, yeah. uh, the passion, the, um, the, uh, the competency, yeah, looking at where those overlap. Sweet spot. But now there's also a way um, people get trapped in their environments, and well, that let's, may be let's... that may start artificially, but it becomes real. Yeah, first of all, I don't believe any of victims uh, speak shit. Well, so, so here's a here's a here's a quick uh, quick little story. I was uh, working with somebody in the, um, the she was in New York, very well paid, felt trapped by her circumstances, wasn't from America. Mm-hmm had brought over some of her family and was mm-hmm. supporting her family mm-hmm. and you know, didn't like her job mm-hmm. and was looking at it just within the, I don't like my job, I don't like yeah. my job. So that's when you have that painful discussion with your family about going back. Well, so... <laughs> yeah. so you're not trapped. We, it's victim speak. So you're... You, it, I just it's don't funny. believe it. You, you must have been in there. Yeah. Her, I don't believe in the concept turns, of a victim speak. Turns out <laughs> her family was very important to her. Yeah, that's And right. as soon as she Passion. realized, as soon as she realized this is what it was about, yeah. the job became a means to an end. Yeah. And okay. the pain just went away. Yeah. So the, the last overlay to this process for me is you have to actually, again, being vulnerable, understanding your, your passions and your competency, where all these things kind of play together, is you now have to uh, be honest with yourself about do you care what others think. All right, and now... That's the hardest part. Because <laughs> if you care, you can be really passionate. You can be really competent. You Now you know your weaknesses. But if you look at that little... The, 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 in all social media, the basically the lever, you're never going to be totally transparent, but you're never going to be totally closed off either. It's always kind of a moving a scale well, that moves back and forth. Now, right? come on, let me, let me push back, right? It's, sure. You're only the man in the mirror a couple times a day. You're the man in the window mm-hmm. all day long. Yeah. Why, why shouldn't you care what other people think about you? Well, I, I, think, well, I think that ultimately this gets down to the separation between entrepreneurs and employees. An employee wakes up and rolls out of the rack and says, the company's going to pay me today. And an entrepreneur rolls out of the rack and says, I'm going to pay me today. And that, that is a fundamental wiring that people have. And entrepreneurs, by their very nature, don't care what other people think. Because it, it goes back to the arrogance slash confidence of there's got to be a better way, which is the wiring behind all entrepreneurs. From Hewlett Packard to Steve Jobs to pick somebody off the, to you to me to pick anybody out of the thing, that these people are so arrogant to believe that there is a better way. They're telling the world, "I don't give a shit what you think." It's funny. I um, <clears throat> I care. Yeah, sure. It just doesn't stop me from moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and once again, you're looking at that. You're looking at that lever. And you're saying you do care. I look at that lever, and that's why I can you know, talk openly about rap music or porn or strippers or drugs or any of that stuff, because I just don't give a shit. Uh, I, I mean, I don't care. If someone likes me or loves me, they'll give me some feedback, and I'll accept it, and I'll probably process it and reflect on it. But if someone gives me feedback that I don't care about, 
it goes into a bucket in my mind. I just never think about it. Isn't that dangerous? What's 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 more dangerous to me is not doing that. Like one of the things I've realized. One of the things I've realized is uh, I'm not successful. So William, if people give you feedback that you don't care about, uh, isn't that a little dangerous to just say, "Look, I'm just not going to listen to to these people." It is dangerous when you're not a reflective person. Like if you don't have the capability or uh, the part of your brain where you like to uh, to to exercise the ability to uh, understand feedback, be able to categorize it, reflect on it, learn from it, most importantly, uh, and then move forward. If you don't have that, then yeah, you should take all feedback. Problem with taking all feedback is then you have no scale, no mechanism to then grade. So. Uh, somebody that you don't know and doesn't love you and it really doesn't have your best interests at heart can then give you feedback, but really that feedback sucks. It's not that it sucks, it's that you shouldn't listen to it. So it's how do you tune your ear to uh, listen and accept feedback and then what do you do with it once, once, you, once you have it. So I built a model because I'm, I'm that type of geeky person. I built a framework around feedback that on one axis uh, is uh, solicited, unsolicited, and on the other axis is positive, negative. So the, the best, first of all, anything that's unsolicited, unless I ask explicitly how you feel, then I don't care. Someone sends me an email, a text message, calls me on the phone, leaves me a voicemail, gives me some type of unsolicited. Positive or negative. Doesn't matter. I now, what about, <clears throat> what about indirect feedback? It's the same stuff. It's just really? a, Yeah, I don't care. If I didn't ask for it, I don't care about it. Well, no, with indirect feedback, I'm yeah. talking about, you know, you approach somebody who you want to get a, a positive response mm -hmm. from, you say hello, that nope. person turns on their heel and walks away. Yeah, well, first of all, then that's negative. It's not positive. I don't ask for positive or negative feedback. If, if it's a solicitation, so if I go into my brain and say, mm, and I usually do it with people that A, I respect and love, and I know that they're intelligent. It's probably why so, you've never asked me for feedback. Yeah, there you go. So there's a couple, and I'm meaning to talk to you about that. So <laughs> there's a couple of like, okay, if I don't ever ask you, it's no, nothing personal. It's just that I don't want your feedback. Um, but if I want your feedback, you can be as brutally honest. Like I've, I'm open. I'm vulnerable. I'm okay with it. You've already you, been. You've been naked. You've been I, in front of the mirror, yeah, right? I've, I'm ready for it at that point. So the thing is, I don't get as much feedback because everything that comes in little mailboxes that's unsolicited, I throw it over into the you know uh, mailbox that uh, you know the mailbag that goes to Santa. I don't care. You know, it strikes me that the very advice. <clears throat> that you would give somebody to be successful mm -hmm. that's going to work at a particular level mm -hmm. is the very same advice that somebody who's starting off in this area, who's asking those first questions about authenticity, who's just getting started mm -hmm. with putting themselves out on social media. Yep. If they were to try to do what you're doing now, they would just fail. Yep. They would just get their butts handed yep. to them. <clears throat> well, some of, some of it is you deal with, okay, they're jobbers. Uh, ultimately, when you get down to it, there are people that are entrepreneurs, or people, you know, Elvis people, Beetle people. There's entrepreneurs, there's employees. If you're an employee, you should never be that transparent on social media, ever. I don't care how authentic you are, you should never be that transparent because ultimately you're a jobber. It will always come back to bite you. So you've got the little needle that you're going to move over, but oh, by the way, you shouldn't move that needle too far over because you should be always thinking about a job. If you are an entrepreneur, you're never worried about that part. No, when I'm when I'm worried when I'm talking with uh, when I'm worried, sure. When I'm talking with folks about this, uh, I, I see a lot of different ways to divide the universe, and just continuing to go with the entrepreneur and mm -hmm. and, and jobber sure. uh, division. Uh, one, I see a lot of people in that job category who are asking themselves those existential questions, like, should yeah. I, uh, yeah. should I cut loose, right? Yeah. And, and the ability to handle this feedback, I think the, the ability to go through this process and reach a point where they can, they can discern feedback that should be dismissed mm -hmm. versus feedback that should be listened to, right? Yeah. I mean, th there's a, there's a, there's some questions there that they could ask themselves. Yeah. But even, uh, uh, you know, folks who are in jobs today and they're wondering all right how do i what is all this authenticity who should i be out there i got privacy concerns mm -hmm. i got every kind of mm -hmm. you know here comes william tin cup and he's talking openly about uh, drug use and he's swearing and yeah. he's like whoa i'd love to have that kind of flexibility in my life yeah. and now you're saying yeah no not so much for a whole bunch of you yeah 
Yeah, that's uh, you know what we can't all be professional baseball players either. So you're so you're putting yourself on par. You yeah. are so good at social media. <laughs> you are. I just did that. Didn't I? <laughs> well, it's better than last night at dinner. I actually equated myself to the sun uh, in conversation. I said I'm a lot like the sun because a little bit of the sun is great because it gives us photosynthesis. It makes things grow. It, you know, it's fun to look at, especially when you're at the beach. But a lot of sun actually gives you cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Table went flat. <laughs> Evidently, I crossed some line, like because I equated myself to the sun. Well, you know, who it's, knew? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, who would have thought that that would have been a taboo uh, a, a metaphor? What's the um, What's the critical question that people should be asking themselves? Uh, and, and let's dial this back for a second, because I think the, the entrepreneurs out there, they've probably heard enough, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they've, they're like, okay, yeah, check the box. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably not as reflective as I need to be. Yeah. It, this off-the-cuff stuff that he's yeah. doing, whoa, there's mental models that underpin it. Yeah. Uh, somebody who's, uh, yeah, I talk to a lot of folks, and I don't care which side they're on, they're just new to the game. They're, they're unfamiliar with the concept of having themselves out there. Well, I'll tell you, Jason, you're, first of all, it's great content. It's great discussion because I think that the other thing that we haven't touched on yet is this the, the brand part of, of online is that I never wanted to have a brand experience that was disingenuous. So because I'm a marketing geek, I never wanted to market myself in some way as a very empathetic, thoughtful person that once people finally met me, find out that I'm not those things. And it could be cut a lot of different ways, but the point is is that brand drop-off stuff. But this, I mean, this is predicated on a whole heck yeah. of a lot of self-awareness. Yeah, that well, well, if you're not self-aware, what are you aware of? Like, I don't care about your fantasy football league. Hmm. Like, if, you're, if you don't know yourself, who do you know? If you don't love yourself, who do you love? Well, you know, I'm reminded of the scene in, uh, in Knocked Up. <laughs> Hilarious. One of the funniest scenes of anyone when they're sitting there and, you know, I'm pregnant. And what he says is not what you'd expect him to say. Uh, so uh, Paul Rudd's character, yeah. you know, says at one point, yeah, I'm, I'm incapable of accepting that my life loves, my wife loves me for who I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, so a lot of people are not self-aware that should be by choice. Line. Well, here's right. the deal. You listen to this. This is Tony Robbins 101. Stop listening to the call right now. <laughs> right. Get out a tablet. Get out a pen. And right. why don't you be reflective for like five minutes? And like, let's go ahead and discover some of those things. But truthfully, uh, yeah, please keep listening. But the, the thing is, is you should invest in yourself. Care enough about yourself to spend some time discovering. Because I do believe that we have a bunch of people that are employees currently, but secretly they're entrepreneurs. So what's broken in their system is they haven't given themselves, they haven't invested in themselves to unearth the possibility that maybe it isn't about social media. Maybe I'm just in the wrong place. Yeah. And you know, then I, it all works out. Look, I, and I'll, I'll give those folks a, I'll, I'm gonna. And the other side is true, by the way. There's a bunch of people out there running around Calling themselves entrepreneurs, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Or consultants no. who have do us all a favor, go get, get a, a job. job. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> look, I, I I talk to a lot of people uh, who are frustrated with their state yes. in uh, their professional state. I'm like, look, you know, you, you grew up probably playing little league, right? You hit a you hit a line drive into deep left field along the line. Describe what you do, and all of them, you know, who played baseball for any period of time, will say, well, you know, you, you round first base. You don't just gun it; you round it because you're going to stretch this into a double. Yeah. Well, that's not in the rules anywhere. That's strategy. And you look at how they're going about business, and they're they're frustrated because they grew up playing baseball. They didn't grow up learning the rules of business and the rules of interpersonal dynamics. And so they got to learn those rules mm. first, and then get into the strategies. They're looking at uh, they're looking at. I, I think a lot of people would listen to this conversation and say, "Well, you know, we're, we're the rules of the game." It's like, no, 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 no. That that's the ante. That's the buy-in. If you yeah. want to be successful, it's all in the strategy. And yeah. this is stuff you get to second. Well, and I'll tell you, that, that actually touched on some content we had yesterday. That that people actually artificially think that there are rules in social media, and uh, but there's not. There's no. There's no rules. There's in social media. no rules in social media. It's actually <laughs> it's actually the opposite end of that. There are no rules in social media. Uh, and everyone has idiosyncratic behaviors in social media. So, like, I'll, I'll give you one of mine. 
I, I refuse to follow someone unless they're following me. Meaning, okay, uh, I've accepted your uh, dumbass shit in Twitter that you're going to Starbucks and you hate your wife and you got all these things going on. I've accepted that by following your content. Now, I would like for you to follow my content. Like, we now have a mutual relationship together where I follow you and listen to your stuff. You follow me and you listen to my stuff. That is not a rule per se. That's not something that everyone lives by. It's a tin rule. cup special. That's an idiosyncratic behavior. Like, I have a bunch of those in my world. Uh, and so, you know, people that do a bunch of political posturing stuff in Facebook, I don't unfriend them because I might need them at one point. I just unfollow or unsubscribe so that I never see their stuff. All right, so so bring that back to so yes, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people looking for the rules of the game when they should be more focused on the strategy of the game. It's got to work for you, which is this could be the subtext to the entire conversation. Jason is ultimately it's got to work for you, not for your neighbor, not for your wife, not for your brother, not for the guy in the next cube. It's got to work for you. It's deeply personal. But a brand isn't about me. A brand is how I project to other people. So, it's both. So ooh. there's no such thing. It's a brand is one. Brr, the record just skipped. Yeah. What? The brand is for me? Yeah. The brand is just one thing. There is not multifacets to the brand. It's just one brand. That's the biggest mistake that I see with people is that they have an online brand and an offline brand. And what happens is you create disharmony when people interact with the two of those. And they're trying to reconcile, you know, loud and obnoxious Jason with quiet and... Good thing the quiet Jason doesn't exist. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Well, but the yes. point is, is it's it's a game of alignment of those things to basically say it's just one brand. So this goes back to what you were talking about earlier in terms of getting naked in front of that mirror. I get naked in front of the mirror a lot, evidently. I yeah, apparently. Well, just once in the front of a call, and we're off to the races. But it it, it sounds like authenticity and branding. If somebody's looking at branding and saying there's nothing authentic about polishing the brand for others, they're they're not doing it right. They haven't started from the right place. That's right. They're rotten from the core, actually, because they, they think that they can play a game of perception. No judgment, <laughs> no, no judgment here. You're yeah. just rotten at the core. You have no moral core. compass. No, <laughs> we, just, uh, we just hate you at a deep level. <laughs> there's a darkness to you. I'm not going to call you Lucifer. <laughs> However, um, the thing is, is you're trying to play a game of perception. This happens in the consumer world all the time. It happens in the B2B world all the time, too. But you have this experience where people position themselves either online or through advertising on Otherwise, only to find that shore, that store experience is deeply opposite than the brand experience. Yeah, it doesn't work in retail. Turns out it doesn't work anywhere else either. Now, since since leaving Star Tin Cup, mm-hmm. you've embarked on a new adventure. I have. Yeah. Uh, how have how has all of this translated? How did you make the transition? Did your brand? You know, first of all, the... credit to uh, to Brett and all the guys at Star Tin Cup. Quite frankly, because it was the best exit ever. I uh, they tell you. This is actually a rule in advertising, marketing, and PR. If your client's voices ever send you into a fit of rage, like they're just the voices, not the content, uh, you should get out. You're burnt out. It's time to go. And uh, while co-founding the firm, I think probably people perceived that it was really hard for me to leave. Uh, it, it, it was hard on one level. Uh, it was easy to walk away from because I was ready. I was emotionally uh, bankrupt because I was just tired of dealing at that point, at that time with clients that, that I thought just disrespected uh, what we did, the value that we gave, etc. So, you know, on some level, I just, uh, I needed to get out. So Brett threw me one hell of a life preserver. The other is on the greed side, I saw a market opportunity that I wanted to explore and exploit. Uh, in our little limited world, the HR software world, uh, most of those firms are organized around selling software, the, right. the prospect to buyer uh, world. Uh, very few of them are really got great uh, knowledge and great energy around after they're a buyer, how do we get them to be super users? Or User engagement. Deeply right. engaged uh, users. So I don't so I don't spend a couple million dollars on software and use 10% of it. Yeah. So I, I focus my, the business, so the market opportunity is brilliant from this perspective. No one does it well. How did you, how did you, now, I think I know the answer to this. The question that a lot of people would ask is how would you, how did you transition your brand? 
and I'm, I'm guessing that the answer is somewhere along the lines of your brand needs to uh, rise above what you do every day and be more attached to kind of who you are and how you do it. Well, that's, uh, there's some good content in there because one is Star 10 Cup operated as Star 10 Cup uh, and they had legal right to do it, but also they wanted to, uh, what I've come to understand, which I, I really appreciate, is they wanted to be respectful of what I was doing next. So my name, actually, 10 Cup, was on my company it was also on my former company, Star 10 Cup. They rebranded most recently, and it looks gorgeous. They did it at HR Tech, and they're now the, the Star Conspiracy. Gorgeous brand. Everything looks beautiful. And, oh, by the way, they got that jerk off 10 Cup completely off the moniker, which is great. So one of the things that I had to do with iconography, which is a part of brand, is I had a fairly infamous photo of me in a trucker hat, and uh, you know, a mechanic's shirt on, smoking a cigar, that had to start tin cup gear. Yep. So one of the things is, first of all, that's all start tin cup. Like, okay, well, this photo that people have come to relate to me, which I'm cool with. I like smoke, smoking cigars. Um, I can't have that photo. And oh, by the way, any photo that I put up will be unfairly judged against that photo. Which, by the way. Is is an icon. Yeah, this is an I- yeah. iconic I image. I mean, picture yeah. picture your marketing guy, and this is the guy. This is the CEO of the of a marketing firm. He's in a trucker hat. It's got a huge star tin cup uh, the, uh, stitched on uh, badge. You got the uh, the uniform like yeah. you're working at the gas station. Damn. Same stitched on badge. Ray Bans with yeah. uh, blue tint glasses. And you are not just smoking a cigar. You are puffing Damn. out a cloud of smoke. And that cloud yeah. of smoke is. It stands out against the red background. I'll just yeah. say that. We're just kind of, you know, this is a, this is a shout out to Suge Knight and, uh, you know, <laughs> Notorious B.I.G. But ultimately, I shot that photo for my uh, 40 under 40 in Fort Worth. Uh, that was the photo because they said in the photo shoot that you could bring a prop. And so all these jerk offs were bringing baseball bats and like uh, footballs and pictures of their wives and stuff like that. I'm like, hey, I'm just going to bring a cigar. So I started smoking a cigar, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, you said to bring a prop. So, <laughs> there you go. Here we go. So, you know, I'm just smoking, and they're like, they go, eventually the photographer's like, well, we'll just start taking pictures. I'm like, yeah. That's the idea. Yeah, you just could you want you to just do your job. So uh, that photo then became the icon. Now, when I left, that, that actually was important to me because, I, A, I didn't want to confuse the market. I didn't want to go out there and have that photo out there because then people would ask me, what are you doing? I noticed that you're doing something different, but then all your everything, your your brand, the imagery has still got all the Star 10 Cup stuff. So uh, I developed my own logo uh, for 10 Cup & Co., which is a 10 Cup. It's, a, it's actually a pretty nice little logo. And I use that logo everywhere. So all the rules around people don't buy from icons and logos and shit like that. I, yeah, I don't believe any of that shit. So ultimately, I did it because I had a good reason. I had to. And I couldn't put any photo, and any other art would be unfairly judged. So my logo is on everything. But I even went further. Now, you can't meet me and me not have my logo on. So I'm constantly reinforcing that logo. Now, all that is to get to the next place, which I'll then go and do, do something deeply personal. So you've actually done a couple of things. One, you started small. But you started, you started with what you look like. I mean, it's, you started outside in. It's not just what you do. It's, it's right. the person that people see when they look at you. Right. Uh, secondly, you've given yourself a ramp. Mm-hmm. You didn't leave and just say, hey, it's going to be tomorrow. I mean, mm-hmm. If I heard you correctly, you just said, hey, imagery first yeah. and then introduce the personal stuff second. Yeah. So, and, and you and I have had a chance to actually have some conversations yeah. about this. I know the business model you have is, uh, yeah. follows a similar flow. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, is I do want to, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to doing something deeply personal with the branding side. It'll probably be in 2013. Mm-hmm. I'll probably ride 2012, really get my brand everywhere that I need it to be, and then I'll do something deeply personal, like, like, like have a tattoo of my logo on my face or something like that. Like literally now I'm going to, you're, you're accustomed to the logo, not going away. Oh, by the way, you probably want to know what I look like. Fair. Like, I'm cool with that. And so I'll, I'll probably, you know, I've got to figure that out. But that's all in front of me. I needed to do something from a personal brand uh, perspective that was respectful of Star 10 Cup uh, and also respectful of me. So, and you, you have to be aware. 
I guess, another another thing to consider. So we've got, uh, there's one last topic I want to touch on. Sure. And before we get to it, I just want to recap some of the themes that I've that I've picked up. The first is you got to know who you are and you have to be honest with yourself about who you are. And it doesn't have to be a conversation you share with others, but mm -hmm. at least when you look in the mirror, you got to know what you're dealing with. Uh, secondly, you have to be able to reach a point where whether you care or not about what other people are saying about you, you're making decisions based on a set of criteria that you are true to right. that aren't changing or being influenced That's by right. the feedback you get. It fits you. It, right. So yeah. you don't listen to feedback in certain ways. I hear it differently. But mm -hmm. I think where we agree is yeah. the criteria, the criteria. If that yeah. feedback don't move the needle, they don't move the needle. That's right. So that's a second piece. A third piece is when it comes to branding, branding, it's it's one you mm -hmm. inside and out. Yep. So it's a question of really matching yourself to an audience, not trying to appeal to right. an audience. And the kind of the corollary to that is you're not going to do it today. Mm. This is going to be the, the path is the branding. Yeah. Long road. And uh, you never want anyone that interacts with you to have a uh, to have disharmony. Like, if they don't like you, then they're not going to like you. Right. Uh, you want them to not like you. <laughs> yeah, like they're right. going to know that immediately. And that's, yeah, you're good. You're filtered, right? But ultimately, you never want them to go and go, I, you know, I don't get it. I, I, you don't want the yes, but. Yeah. <laughs> Great improvisational. Yes, right. and. Yeah, right. You never want the, yeah, nice guy, but. Ah, I don't understand. He never curses. You know, it's like you want them to like automatically, like there's a procession. This is the Catholic in me. You want them to have a procession, an understanding, a procession of who you are, what you're about, how to interact with you before they ever get to you. Now, so the last topic that I want to touch on, and we only have just a, a couple of minutes for this, is you're not going to be perfect with that. Mm -hmm. You are going to create discord. You are going to make mistakes. You I are going to so. fail. Yeah, I hope so. How do you deal with failure? Well, failure is a lot like uh, when you're trying to build muscle in anything. It's the little tears in muscle that happen. That's failure. So you really only get muscle growth when you tear shit, right? Well, you really only learn stuff when you fail. So people that uh, either uh, don't like failure or fear of failure or whatever, you've already put yourself into a bucket in my mind of people that just will never learn or think that they already know everything. So I actually look forward to failure. I try to fail like every couple of hours. <laughs> now, how do you how do you stay consistent with your brand when you're failing? Especially now, because the brand is built around failing. All right, so but let's let's back up the clock. Somebody's really just starting. Sure. Right. That that first go out of the gate, mm -hmm. something happens. It's not what you expected. Mm -hmm. You didn't get the feedback. Unintended right? you, consequence. You failed. Yeah. Was it? because of something you did? Was yeah. it because this wasn't the match you thought it was? Mm -hmm. How do you start assessing the environment to figure you, out at what level that failure occurred? You, you do it in nanoseconds. And what you do is you basically acknowledge it, you give it power, you... You acknowledge it. You acknowledge the failure. What a novel concept. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, there's failure. Mm. Okay. Where people get wrapped around the axle is that they take that failure and then they want to stay there for a while. They want to play with it. Well, the ego they can't deal with it, right? So right. they gotta they end up yeah. creating all kinds of weird yeah. mental games for you them. have to give it power so first of all you have to it's visible uh, you have to have the insight and visibility to see the failure you know three-dimensionally and then you got to be able to say hmm, yeah that was kind of fucked okay what can I learn from that and then you process that you learn from it and then you forgive yourself and you move on and all that happens in seconds not minutes not hours not days not months not years Seconds. Now, so I'm, you build up a, an, ap, an an appetite for being able to process. First of all, you just got to be able to see the failure for what it is. Guess what? No one died here. Great. All right. <clears throat> what was it again? I'm going to go back to one of the very first things that I pushed back in you on, which sure. was that people don't uh, they don't fail at this because they don't understand it. They fail at this because they lack the emotional strength mm -hmm. to deal with it. What you're talking about requires one thing that is so hard for so many people, and that is a lack of closure. I'm going to make the mistake, forgive myself, and move on. I'm not going back to that. Yeah. I'm not going to go back and say, oh, by the way, this is what I intended yeah. to do. Did you? Uh -huh. There's no closure. You're moving forward. You process it. That I tell people I'm, on a, I'm an amazing defensive back because I've never been burned for a TD. And I'll never be burned for a TV. Well, no, because the moment you, I was burned, you don't play anymore, yeah. which, <laughs> which is a great way to manage your brand. Retire. Good point. <laughs> Good point. Last game. No, the the thing is, is the the best defensive backs in the world all have one thing in common. 
They they all put it out on the field. They play they, as they hard did, as they can. They kick my ass. That's they, one thing they have. They gone. get burned. They they went for the ball. They went for the interception. Guy juked them. Went all the way to the house, and they process it for six seconds, and they're back out to never been burned again. I've never been burned before. So they don't they they process it. So they acknowledge it. So first of all, to not acknowledge. Uh, your failures, mm, that's a bad philosophy. Let's not do that. Acknowledge it. Give them power. And then what can I learn from that? Okay, maybe I shouldn't take an Ambien, drink three vodkas, and then get on Facebook. But now what you bet, I mean, the the first thing we talked about was this photo where you're talking about mm-hmm. you know drugs in high school. Mm-hmm. And granted, they were legal. Yeah. But some of these failures now, they're out there for the world to see. Are right. you saying that it's okay to own it and move forward even though they're out there? Oh, yeah, because at one point somebody's going to get to ask me a question. And then I get to actually tell them the story and give them the context. And if they, first of all, they're filtering in and out out of all that stuff. So if they've self-selected, oh, God, wow, he did X, that's a person I would never work with. Like if they make the judgment of me when I was 17 years old that I did ecstasy, and oh, by the way, it was legal at the time, and they want to make a judgment about me, and they don't want to work with me, they just told me everything I need to know about them for life. So yeah. I'm okay with never knowing them. Are you, the, are you the same guy you were when you were 17? I'm better. Wisdom, age, experience, it's all the stuff that you know about life later on. Um, I'm better. I'm better at everything. I'm better. I mean, you know, it, it really is. At 43 years old, I wish I could give, go back and give myself at 17, 18 some advice. But all of those experiences that led up to the guy that I am now, that's what made me. All those failures. So even though if I had the ability to go back and give that advice, I'm not sure I would. So authenticity, definitely a more subtle topic than I think a lot of people give it credit for. Deeply personal. Well, and deeply personal and, and as, you know, hopefully one of the things that I hope comes across here, as we were just talking about, it's not rule driven. It's got to fit you. I mean, it, there's, a, there's this whole business that's kind of cropping up that's actually kind of interesting around custom shoes where they're, they're taking three-dimensional models of your feet and, and what they're basically saying to the market is mass production of shoes is actually causing a lot of walking problems, causing a lot of back problems, causing a lot of headaches because the shoes don't fit. So your shoes should fit you, you and just you. Yeah, your right foot's, uh, you know. Sure, my ski boots are like that. Yeah, your, your, your right foot's a little bit bigger and a little bit wider than your other one. You'll never get something off the shelf, no matter how expensive, that actually fits you. Well, social is that. You can't look at others. You look at yourself, and then you say, this shoe's got to fit me. Custom orthotics, the analogy will end on. Love it. Uh, listen, very, very robust conversation. Hopefully you'll come back to Beyond yeah. Social. We'll explore this a little bit deeper. Be happy to. Uh, this has been Beyond Social. I'm Jason Seiden, your host. I want to say thanks to William Tincup, our guest today, talking about authenticity online. Uh, for more information, take a look, ajaxsocialmedia.com slash beyondsocial. We'll see you next week.